Welcome to Gospel in Life. Thank you for joining as we go through this special series of meditations by Tim Keller, Trusting God in Difficult Times. This new series is meant to encourage you to trust God more deeply and to meditate on His Word and what it promises to give you strength and hope in difficult times. And now here's today's meditation. For our last study on the book of Habakkuk, we're going to look at maybe the most famous verses in the book, chapter 3 near the end. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there be no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fail, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. Now, uh, this is very famous because here you have uh, Habakkuk talking about rejoicing in the Lord even when the circumstances around him are all basically falling apart. In, a, in, a, in an economy like Israel's, in an, in an ancient society, have no, the, no fig tree uh, fruit, no grapes on the vines, no olive crop, the fields producing no food, no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls. This isn't just a bad year. I mean, that's a, that's a terrible time. That's a time of death. Uh, it's a time of famine. That's, a, that's a, a, an awful time. And yet, he says, I can still be joyful in the Lord. How do you do that? One of the most moving uh, pieces of church history I've ever read comes from uh, 1851, where there was an English missionary named Alan Gardner. Uh, he was shipwrecked with a number of other people on a very remote, uninhabited island uh, just off the tip of South America. And they died on that island, one at a time, one at a time, and from what we can tell, uh, he was the last one alive. And he kept a journal that was found right next to his body. And the very last entry was a, uh, a quote from Psalm 34, verse 10. The young lions do, do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. And the very last thing he wrote in his journal, as he was dying, and as he was dying all around him, uh, with people dying all around him, and as he knew he would never see his family again, he said, I am overwhelmed with a sense of the goodness of God. So here's a man dying of starvation, body broken, all hopes dashed. He wanted to be a missionary. He never got to be a missionary. And he says, I'm overwhelmed with the goodness of God. Now, you and I, infer the goodness of God from the good things that are happening to us. I think that's how we do it. When we say, oh, God's been very good to me, we mean there are certain good things happening and then we infer the goodness of God. But Alan Gardner must have gotten directly in contact with that goodness because there were no good circumstances. Everything was wrong. The fig tree hadn't budded. There was no olives. There was no grapes. There was no cattle. There was no sheep. Nothing. And yet, I'm overwhelmed, overwhelmed with a sense of the glory of God. How did he do that? How does Habakkuk say to do it? There's three ideas, even in these, these verses. Repeating, remembering, and rejoicing. Repeating, verse 18, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. There's a repetition. And I don't think we should uh, forget about that. If we're trying to really rejoice in the Lord, get in contact with His goodness directly, we have to have uh, practices in our lives. We needed to, to, work, to pray to him every day, or maybe twice a day, or maybe three times a day. Repetition is extraordinarily important. Why do we have four Gospels? I mean, why not just one Gospel? I'll tell you why, because the repetition shows us Jesus over and over and over again, somewhat different perspective, each Gospel goes deeper. And so there's a need for repetition. There's a need for Bible memory. There's a need for regular prayer. There's a need for uh, daily uh, hours of prayer. There's a need for repetition because we are uh, creatures that work through habit. So first, repeat. Secondly, remembering. The, the rest of chapter three, I only read you a little piece of chapter three. Most of chapter three is going back over the history of Israel and all the things that God has done. And one of the ways to get in touch with the goodness of God when there's no uh, nothing happening right now in your life that seems good is to remind yourself of all the other things he's done for you. But lastly, rejoice in the Lord. I don't know what that means. I think it means praise. 
not just think about the good things he's done. I think what must have happened to Alan Gardner there was he was getting in touch with who God is. He couldn't say, oh, thank you for all the things that are happy, good happening, the good things that are happening because they, they weren't happening. But he was actually thinking about God's holiness and his grace and his love for us in Jesus Christ. He was praising. I do think a lot of us in our prayer lives do an awful lot of petition and maybe even a lot of confession. How much time do you spend praising? How much do you, time do you spend rejoicing in God for who he is in himself? So, repetition, through repetition, remember and rejoice and praise him. And you can get directly into contact with the goodness of God. And now here's Tim and Kathy Keller for a short time of Q&A on today's meditation. Uh, listening to you talk about that, it just reinforced in me how big a deal circumstances are as far as our sense of God's goodness to us. We really do take our uh, understanding of whether he's been good to us based on whether our circumstances are good. And if our circumstances are bad, we're begging him to right. change those circumstances. Um, I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, but I couldn't help but think, uh, and I hope everybody will write this down, um, the uh, eulogy that Jonathan Evans gave for his mother at his Lois, mother's Lois, funeral. Yeah. yeah, Lois. You can Google it, Jonathan Evans, E-V-A-N-S, eulogy. And there's, there's the whole thing there. You can read it all, and I would encourage you to do that. You can listen to the whole, but there's a two-minute clip right at the top where he says, that God was trying to teach him that just because I didn't answer your prayer your way doesn't mean I didn't answer your prayer anyway. We often don't see God's answers to prayer because we're looking for something else. We're looking for him to fix this, change that, alter that, change our circumstances somehow, and we don't see the answer that he's actually giving. Um, how does one develop the capacity to see the answers that God is giving and not the answers that we're looking for? Well, John Newton um, has a line in one of his letters in which he says, uh, using slightly archaic language to us, everything is needful that he sends, nothing can be needful that he withholds. Now, I turned that over the years as I've meditated on it into a statement that I think helps, even though some people resist it, but it, and so do I. But here's, here's the statement. God gives you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knows. Now, I think when, logically that is hard to refute, that if we had the perspective that God had, if we could, we could see the end from the beginning, if we could see all hearts, if we knew everything that was, all the contingencies, that therefore what he was giving you was what you would have asked for, that he actually always answers your prayer as you would have made it if you knew everything he knows. And yet I find that that's still on some occasions pretty hard for even me to swallow, even though I formulated it out of John Newton's uh, uh, principle. So I think that's the way to do it is to say, in some ways he doesn't answer prayers. I mean, obviously he, you know, he didn't answer Jesus' prayer directly when he said, let this cup pass from me. But in other ways... I did he, answer it. He just said no. He, yes, I mean, he, no he, is an answer. Right. And yet at the same time, uh, we all have a... It, when we pray, we not only have a something we, we, we think will give us what we want, but we also have the want. And God is saying, look, I will give you the, your heartfelt desires, but not necessarily in the way you want. Actually, you've, you've sort of... I, I didn't bring this up, but th you've finished out... Jonathan Evans' thought in that eulogy he's doing for his mother because he, he goes on to say, please look, please Google that, Jonathan Edwards' eulogy. He goes on to say, because he's going to, he Jonathan says Jonathan Evans. So, Evans, not Edwards, right. Evans. He um, says it so much better than I'm going to be able to quote it. He says, there's only ever two answers to the prayer that you made for her. his mother was dying. That There's only ever two ways that prayer could have been answered. Either she was going to be healed or she was going to be healed. Either she was going to be all right, or she was going to be all right. Either she was going to be with friends, or she was going to be with friends. You know, 
we want it to be the first way, our time, our place, you know, our circumstances. But the only way God answers prayers is with what we ask for or something better than we could have imagined. If you found today's meditation encouraging, please subscribe below and be sure to share it with a friend to encourage them as well. And if you'd like to hear more teachings by Tim Keller, you can listen to new sermons every week at gospelandlife.com slash podcast. Thanks again for watching Gospel and Life.